Hello, welcome to Quest for Truth. This is episode 18. We are currently in Revelation chapter 4. Uh, last time we made it through all of, uh, what, maybe two verses, something like that? Maybe not even that much, Rob. But we did talk about the, pre, the pre-trib rapture, or the rapture in general. Really, Again, we're on a quest for truth. We're, we're not so much concerned about doctrines and dogmas and theologies. We're, we're concerned about what God's Word actually says. And, you know, sometimes it can be a, a painful pill to swallow when what we discover in the Word does not always match up with our theology. And, you know, we don't throw out any theology quickly or lightly, but we always want to be completely open to what the Word of God says uh, over and against anything that the Word of man might say. So that's just something to to consider as we continue to uh, look at um, the things we have here in Scripture. So I I think we pretty well covered the rapture and... uh, uh, Well, we did. And I gave my position, but you didn't give your position. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you what you asked me at the table one time at a conference. <laughs> so, Doug, where are you on the issue of the rapture? <laughs> well, Rob, you know, um, I'm, I'm wanting to be prepared as, as, as well prepared as I can, and, and, and hopefully I won't need it. But, uh, you know, I, I'd love to get out of here uh, as quickly as possible. I'm ready to go anytime the Lord wants to take me. But uh, frankly, I, I do find quite a few holes in, in the preacher of rapture position uh, because uh, primarily I don't find a text that tells me anywhere that Jesus is going to rapture us before the beginning of the seven-year period. Uh, as we talked about last show, uh, the day of the Lord is not the entire seven-year period. It's actually the day that Jesus comes back. So you know, if I'm raptured sometime before the day that Jesus comes back, uh, or let's say even the moment before he comes back, that would still qualify as a pre-wrath uh, rapture, as we talked about. Um, and you know, the passage in Second or First Thessalonians chapter four, uh, it, it doesn't it doesn't necessitate a pre-trib rapture. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, again, I, I want to go as soon as possible. I I, I uh, remember as a boy looking up to the sky, thinking maybe Jesus will take me today. You know, and, and I just kept you know hoping when I would see a beautiful sunset maybe Jesus is gonna break through the the heavens and, and take us you know be, take us up to heaven it's a wonderful hope but you know is it founded in scripture if it is great but if it's not then we need to uh, you know gently uh, release such a thing and and though I was very much strongly in the pre-trip camp uh, I'm finding there's there's much less evidence for it so you know, I I, I uh, I've kind of gone back and forth looking at you know maybe the the, the mid trip position. If I look at Isaiah chapter twenty six, where it says that the ra- the resurrection appears to happen on the same day that the abyss is opened. And that's where the Rephaim are going to come out uh, of the abyss. Uh, so that then coupled with come my people enter into your chambers until the indignation is passed. Uh, that sure sounds like you know some pretty cataclysmic event. This is because the Lord comes out of His place. Well, the Lord coming out of His place must be the second coming. So, you know, where are these uh, resurrected people being placed? Uh, you know, resurrected slash everybody else who's kind of under God's care at that point. Are where are they being placed? Are they being put in Petra? Are they taken up to the Lord's presence? Uh, you know, there, so, some questions still remain in there for me, but uh, you know that is a passage that I find is always ignored when it comes to the question of the rapture. And and as you pointed out, Rob, Matthew twenty four twenty nine, you can't really get around that. Now, I I do believe when it talks about the elect, that it is talking first and foremost about the Jewish people because they are the elect. Uh, but as I see, what Paul tells us is that it's to the Jew first, and then also to the Gentile. So what's happened in our dispensational theology is that we've kind of made it about the church first. Right? We've made it about somewhat the Gentile first, and then maybe if there's anything left over, the Gentile or the Jews can get that. But I see that God's plan has always been specifically and primarily for the Jews 
and then those who are brought into the commonwealth of Israel will be able to share in those blessings. But it's not like the blessings are for the church. The blessings are for those of Israel who believe, and then also to those who are of the Gent you know, Gentiles, such as myself, who are then grafted in and become part of that, that number. So, you know, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm one of the elect because I've been grafted in. But I'm not, a, I'm not elect because I am a believer. I'm elect because I was, because of my belief in Jesus, I became grafted into the elect of God. And, uh, and then I get to enjoy those promises as well. I'm glad you, I'm glad you mentioned that. <laughs> Um, because I found, it, you know, there are people like Steve Quayle out there who is about as anti-pre-trib as they get. I mean, he's he's hardcore anti-pre-trib. He talks about it being conjured up by witches in a seance or something. I forget what his <laughs> what the whole idea. Anyway, he he talks about it quite a bit. But um, I found that you have to require it like. To believe in the pre-trib rapture requires dispensationalism. You have to be a, a dispensationalist to be, believe in the pre-trib rapture, and dispensationalism hasn't been around for very long. It, it's it's been around, you know, since Darby, um, and, and that was the other thing because I was a hardcore dispensationalist too, dispensational truth and all the different things that I used to study and Clarence Larkin and I had all the books and all that. And um, but I, when I realized, well, wait a minute, I had to reckon with Romans chapter 11, which you just talked about. Romans 11 is the whole grafting. In fact, let's just go ahead and go there because that's a pretty powerful passage. Romans 11, 11 through, I'm going to go ahead and read through verse uh, 24, I think. Uh, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, if their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fa fullness? For I speak to you, Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them, for if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? For if Ooh. the first fruit <laughs> is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree do not boast against the branches but if you do boast remember that you do not support the root but the root supports you and this is where the whole phrase Hebrew roots comes from I am not in the Hebrew roots movement because the particular movement believes a whole bunch of stuff I don't believe mm -hmm. but this is where the phraseology comes from you will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said. Because of unbelief, they were broken off. Who's they? The Israelites that didn't believe, the cultivated olive tree branches, if we, if we will, that did not believe were broken off. And you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell. Severity. But toward you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will those who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the Deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Uh, I'll just stop there, but, you, I mean, right. that's the go-to place, man. That's yeah. like... If yeah. you want to know who, what your identity, and in my opinion, this blows away dispensation theology. You can't, you can't have dispensation, dispensation theology and mm. still believe in the grafting. I, and this is not replacement theology either, by the way. In right. fact, if anybody wants to accuse me of that, I'll point to an actual video clips of dispensationalists who say the words, you know, for a time period, the church has replaced Israel in the plan of God, but then after right. we're raptured, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, right. dude, you just said replaced right. Israel. Yeah. Yeah, That's you know, a big problem. Yeah, yeah, and you know the other thing with 
with the pre-trib position is, you know, you have Jesus coming back for his bride, right? You know, he comes back to get his wife and takes her up to his his place. And, you know, while they're having nuptials and frolicking up in heaven, well, goodness, the Jews are getting beat up down on planet Earth, right? And, right. and we're supposed to be okay with that. I just I don't I have some trouble with that. I don't think Jesus could really sleep well. You know I think he could you know could really uh, have fun with his wife uh, while down on planet Earth everyone is getting beat up and there's this incredible carnage happening. I mean an event worse than the Holocaust is occurring, and yet we're up having a good old time with Jesus dropping grapes into each other's mouth. I mean it just doesn't make any sense. No, yeah, God, God is a loves wife the beater. Jewish people. He loves the Jewish people. And yeah. you know, well, we've talked about it before. How many brides are there? <laughs> right, exactly. I know, but you know, I, I noticed as you're going through here, uh, you know, it's kind of something I saw maybe for the first time here. Uh, Romans eleven fifteen, for if they're being cast away, is the reconciling of the world. So that's mm -hmm. where we are now. Uh, what will their acceptance be? But life from the dead. So if we right. go to Hosea chapter five. Yeah, right on. Hosea chapter 5 tells us that where God says, I will return again to my place till they acknowledge their offense. Then they will seek my face in their affliction. They will earnestly seek me. And, of course, we have also in Zechariah chapter 12, I believe that's the fulfillment, is when they're going to look upon, they're going to look to the one that they pierced, and they're going to mourn for him. As one mourns for an only son and grieve for him, as one grieves for a firstborn. Uh, this is when they're going to acknowledge their offense. They're going to cry their their hearts out. Say, oh my goodness, what have we done? Uh, you know, the one that can save us is the one that we rejected. And, and so they're going to do that. And so, uh, you know, pairing those together is, is a very interesting uh, consideration here that we, we have... Um, you know, essentially, if you have uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 15, where you have their acceptance but life from the dead, I wonder if that could be a reference to the resurrection, that when they finally accept the Lord Jesus, then you will have the resurrection of the dead. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um... You mentioned the phrase "bride of Christ," and we consider ourselves as believers in Yeshua, as believers in Jesus Christ, that we are His bride. Well, uh, who is the bride? If there's only one bride, it's Israel. Um, Israel was married, was betrothed on Mount Sinai. That's the church in the wilderness that Stephen talks about in Acts chapter seven, verse thirty-eight. Um, the church began on Pentecost, but not the Pentecost of A Pentecost of Acts two. It began on the Pentecost in Mount Sinai in the wilderness. That's when God married Israel. Later divorced, but then then he got her back. <laughs> um, and we talked about that in a previous show, so I, I won't go there. But right, uh, yeah. in Revelation twenty one verse two. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as what? A bride adorned for her husband. Who's the husband? The husband is Yeshua. Who's the bride? Right. Well, it's the New Jerusalem. If you keep reading, go down to uh, verse 9 of chapter 21. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And then he was carried away and shown a description and given a description of what? The New Jerusalem that has 12 gates that are described as the 12 tribes of Israel. There's mm -hmm. no mysterious 13th gate called the church. So, I mean, you got to throw – in my mind, this is my opinion, but on my quest for truth, looking at the scriptures and forgetting what men have said in commentaries in your Bible, I had to throw out dispensation theology because there is no – difference between Jew and Gentile after you've been grafted into the cultivated olive tree. You're all one. There's one body, there's one church, there's one bride, and everywhere I look it's described as Israel. So it, there's not there's not a distinction there between the church and Israel. The church is Israel. Interesting. I, I, I would uh, as far as the bride goes, you know, I would say that it's it's uh, the city, it's the New Jerusalem, and the city is comprised of three elements. Uh, one is a geographical location, 
just like New York City, right? We sure. have the, the place on the map. We have the buildings. Those, you know, New York wouldn't be the same without all those buildings. And it's the people, right? So those three elements comprise a city. And I see the same thing being true of Jerusalem, the New Jerusalem. And there's all kinds of passages that, that make reference to this. Uh, people can check out Hosea chapter 2 where God says, I'm divorcing you, sweetheart. And then he's going to remarry her later. He's going to, I says, I'm going to betroth you. I'm going to betroth you again to myself uh, in the future. So we have uh, we have that, and then we have uh, Isaiah 54 where he says, you know, uh, rejoice, O you afflicted one who is tossed about, uh, for I will set your your uh, spires in, in in timony and and you know make all your cover all your walls with your uh, with uh, precious gems and such. So. You know, again and again and again, and then the key passage really is Isaiah 62, verse 5, where it says, For as a young man marries a virgin, so, sh so shall your sons marry you. The you here is feminine singular, it's talking about Jerusalem. And it says, As the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Uh, I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. So he's talking about Jerusalem. And it says that your young, your sons are going to marry you. So I understand the sons, uh, referring to us, you know, Jew or Gentile, that uh, we are going to marry the city. We're going to become fully integrated members of the city. We'll become somehow one with the city. You know, if you're a New Yorker, you're kind of one with the city, right? You're, you're a New Yorker, right? I mean, you're, you're, you're not a building necessarily, but you are part of what constitutes New York City. And, um, you know, so too as citizens of the New Jerusalem, we will be what constitutes, part of what constitutes uh, that, that bride. So, you know, I think that rather than this idea that, that the church is the bride and uh, Israel is the, the wife of Jehovah, I mean, who came up with that one? My goodness. Right. You know, uh, I used to believe that too because of dispensation theology. I believe that Israel was the bride of Jehovah and then the church was the bride of Christ. And you had right. two different, and, and, and the father was a wife beater. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know? Yes, exactly. So, um, but we've kind of gotten far afield here. How well, not we not really, <laughs> not really, because we'll come back around to all this. Um, I think this is necessary. I think this conversation needs to yes. take place. In my opinion, uh, there's a number of scriptures I was just looking at while you were talking regarding the unity of one body. There's not two. It's First uh, Corinthians 12, 12 through 13. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that body, being many, are one body. So also is Christ. For by one Spirit. We were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. So, I mean, that throws out dispensation theology. Ephesians 3, 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. Uh, John chapter 10, verse 16, and I have other sheep. I, I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. So you're not going to have two flocks, two shepherds, two brides. Um, Colossians 1.24, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. And we've already established that there's only one body. Ephesians 5.23, for the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is Savior of the body. One church, one body, one pride. Colossians 1.18, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Now here's where I found people go to for dispensation theology, Ephesians 3, 1 through 6. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which, has, which was given to me for you. That's what I see. See? It's dispensation. It's, Paul is the, the, the guy to, for the dispensation of grace, because we had, what, the dispensation, and help me out here, dispensation of innocence, conscience, uh, government, patriarchal rule, I think, the Mosaic law, and now grace, right? That, that's, yeah. that's, as I remember, my, my old school dispens dispensationology. <laughs> you get <it> uh, away. <laughs> uh, but they'll say, see, you know, he has been given the dispensation of grace for the Gentiles. So that's where they'll, they'll go to this passage right there. Of course, if you look the word up uh, that's used there for dispensation, it's, uh, and help me out with their spelling here, or the pronunciation, oikonomia, 
o oikonomia. Yeah, it's economy, essentially, is what that means. It says, yeah, Strong's number 3622 basically says stewardship or management of affairs, administration. So yeah. it's not talking about a time period, uh, you know, of a convenient stack of time periods that God's working on different plans for different people. No, he's given the administration, the stewardship of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, fellow of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. I mean, these all demolish dispensation theology, in my opinion. Uh, and this is where my quest for truth has led me. And when I looked at all of this, uh, I did a study last week on the Virtual House Church, um, Exodus Week 20. And, uh, man, let me see if I can put up the screen share here. of uh, uh, da, 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 Yeah, concerning the breastplate. This was, like, way cool. Because uh, we were studying in Exodus where it's talking about the uh, outfits of the high priests and stuff. And earlier we learned that everything that Moses was to, to build with the tabernacle and all that was a model, was, was to be modeled after something that existed in heaven, that, that's real in heaven. And so we know we have a high priest in the order of Melchizedek up in heaven. Uh, apparently the high priest garments are modeled after something. Uh, we know in Isaiah that the government shall be on his shoulders, meaning Yeshua, our Savior. Well, on the shoulders of the ephod, you had the onyx stones there that had the uh, two, uh, two, one on each side, and they were the um, sons of Israel uh, listed in birth order. So you had on the right shoulder Reuben through Naphtali, and on the left shoulder Gad through Benjamin. That's on the shoulders, but on the breastplate, you had the 12 tribes. There, there was four rows, three stones per row, and each stone had engraved on it a name of the tribes, and the breastplate order was listed after the uh, the the camp, the encampment in the wilderness, uh, the way the camps were divided up. So uh, the first row represented uh, Judah, Iskar, and Zebulun, and then and this is according to Numbers chapter two verses three through twenty six. Second row was reading right to left was Reuben, Simeon, Gad. Third row uh, Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin. Fourth row. Dan, Asher, and Naphtali. Now, I think the reason why Paul talks about this great mystery uh, is because I, 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 when I was going through this, and you see down below it, that Lucifer has a breastplate too. When he was in heaven, he, he, he had various jewels that were part of his being, um, but he only had nine. And so I was really intrigued by that because they had the 12 breastplates for the high priest that's modeled after the high priest in heaven. And you had Lucifer, who was the anointed cherub um, that covers. He only had nine. Well, which ones were missing? He was missing the third row uh, of, of, of stones there. Well, the third row is Benjamin, Manasseh, and Ephraim. Well, and I'm going to put this back. Uh, I'll switch back to me here if I can. Um, actually, I forgot how to do that. Oh, there we go. Uh, um, what, what really intrigued me about that is Lucifer wasn't – privy to this great plan of God that he had planned from the beginning. He said the, the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. God knew the plan right from the beginning. Well, Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, to the rest of the world, as it were, was of the tribe of Benjamin. That's on the third row. Manasseh and Ephraim, according to the blessing of Jacob, when he crossed his hands over Ephraim and Manasseh, prophesied that they would become nations, many nations. So, the way that Gentiles were reached was by a guy who came from the tribe of Benjamin, and all of that's on the third row. And I was like, wow, <laughs> that just blew me away. And I have to wonder if that's not what Paul was beginning to figure out in some of this. Um, all that to say, uh, I had to throw out dispensation just, just as much as I threw out the pre-trib rapture. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, you know kind of a bummer. <laughs> Because uh, I, I think you know, out of the various systems that there are, the, the dispensational system uh, does probably the, the best job, in, in my opinion. But there are things that if we hold, you know, if we hold too tightly to any system, we're going to have, uh, you know, we're going to have some major uh, flaws. So we we got to stick close to the Bible. That is that's first and foremost what we well, need to be doing. Well, I want to stick close to the heart of my high priest as the breastplate was. So this was the question I asked on my show. I said, are you on the breastplate? 
and you'll notice that there's not a 13th stone called the church. You're either grafted in or you're not. <laughs> uh, and there's only 12 stones there on the, on the chest, on the heart of the high priest. And I want to be on there. So my, my belief, my understanding is that if I, if I was blood-related to any of the 12, then I was one of those branches that was part of the cultivated olive tree that had been broken off until I believe in Yeshua, then I get grafted back in. Um, if I am not blood related to any of these guys, then I'm a wild branch over here that gets grafted in. And I believe I get grafted into the slot of Ephraim, personally, uh, as I look at the scriptures and the, pro the prophecy of Jacob over Ephraim. Uh, I believe that myself as a Gentile uh, got grafted in into the, the, the gate of the New Jerusalem. I probably will go through Ephraim's gate, I'd imagine, and that I'm part of Ephraim's stick of Ezekiel 37, because you have the stick of Judah and the stick of Ephraim. Um, I believe I'm on the stick of Ephraim, uh, being grafted into that branch. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting position that you hold. Um, I, I've, I've thought about it. You know, I mean, I, I think it's it's very provocative, and uh, I think you really might be onto something. So, um, you know, this is this is so exciting just to to consider these things. But we ha we always have to keep Israel in the forefront of our minds, and the fact that that as Gentiles we're grafted in, that we get to be a part of this, we get to enjoy the benefits as well, but never to the exclusion of of uh, of Israel. And, if, and ironically, the very thing that dispensationalists claim not to be doing. Uh, they kind of are doing. Uh, it, you might call yeah, it a, a kind of a, a soft replacement theology, yeah. ironically. Uh, you know, but you know that's that's what I don't appreciate is that this whole thing of well, you know, it's it's all about the church. And what they mean by the church is they're kind of talking about the Gentile church, right? And that that Israel essentially needs to join us versus us sort of going in that direction, not becoming right. Jews, not becoming that, religious. Well, that Jews. violates right. that violates Romans eleven. We, we're not to get the Jew to become like, first of all, all the Christians in the beginning were Jews. So, yes. I mean, that, that blows the whole idea out of the water in the first place because, you know, everybody that was the first Christians, they were all Jews. So how, you can, how can you separate the church from the Jew when the first hundred years or so the church was the Jew? Uh, you know, I mean, that doesn't make any sense. We, we, don't, we don't get the Jew to join us. We, we all have to, Jew, Gentile, whatever you are, Benjamin, you know, Issachar or whatever, we all have to accept Yeshua as our Lord and Savior so that all of us can get grafted into that tree. Um, and, and, I mean, the go-to place, and I'm not going to read it again because we already went over it, but read Romans 11. I mean, it, to me, it can't get any more clear than that. Um, yeah, well, you know, and yeah. so going back to our, our main text here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think we're about out of time for this. No, I think we're still good. We still got about 15 minutes left. Okay, we all by, right. By my reckoning, minutes. excellent. So, excellent. Uh, going back good. to four, I think we we've beat this one to death. It, it's not talking about the rapture. Okay, yes, we're, we're not right. talking about the rapture. Um, so moving on. Um, so verse two. <laughs> okay, well, we, uh, throne in heaven. All right. So who is this one on the throne? Well, obviously it's God. There's no question about that. Now this raises a pretty interesting. Uh, discussion because what does God look like hmm. and you know you'll hear people say well God has no body because according to John 4 24 it says that God is spirit and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth and therefore God has no body right he does not have a, a any kind of a, a corporate body he's a spirit right so we shouldn't be thinking about that anytime the Bible talks about God having a form or a body or hands or head or legs. Uh, it's using anthropomorphic language to describe this being that, that we just have no clue what he could possibly look like. And I used to believe that. I used to teach that. And then I realized, uh oh, that's not even biblical. What are we doing? You know, just another example of where our, our, uh, our long held traditions have have uh, made the word of God to no effect. And so now, you know, we think about what does God look like? You know, you can't help but wonder that. Who is this God that I worship, that I, I claim to serve, and I made in his image? What does he look like? Is he just a blob? You know, is he just some kind of vaporous, wispy, cloudy kind of kind of guy? Or, or what is it? I mean, how do I imagine him in my brain? 
You know, when I finally get to be in his presence, what am I going to see? Just some kind of ball of fire? Or, or what am I going to expect him to see? And, you know, this has been really liberating for me to be able to understand that, that God actually has a form. And his form is, is Adam-like because we are like him. And it's really huge. Yeah, amen, for sure. Uh, and there are some other beings up there that we can look at in verse, uh, well, let's just go right down to the next verse. Um, well, the, the throne is described. And then you have 20 seats there in verse 4. And upon the seats I saw four and 20 elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. What's your opinion on that? Who are the 24 elders sitting there? Well, you know, I don't know. Uh, you know, some people think that, it, that you know, 12 of them are the 12 patriarchs. The other 12 could be uh, the 12 apostles. Uh, I, I think that's possible. I, I don't think it's it, by any means necessary. Uh, some have suggested that it could be, you know, 24 um, angels, that these are the, uh, the Elohim that are described in Psalm 82, where God sits in the, the council of the mighty ones. Hmm. Uh, I think that's a possibility. Uh, though you know, these beings seem to be making reference to, um, you know, to having been been saved uh, and to some extent uh, in, in some capacity. So, you know, that is, that's kind of a, an interesting question, but you know, I don't know. I, I think it is possible that it could be talking about the divine council, and that would be a very interesting uh, take if that's the case. I just don't know if we have enough evidence to really make a hard case for anybody. I don't think we have enough evidence to make the case that it's it's the twelve tribes and the church, or you know, the the apostles, as it were. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think we're lacking that. Although, if you compare it with the 12 gates and the 12 foundations of the city yeah, itself. That's where I was going to go. You know, then it would seem to validate this notion that it is the 12 patriarchs plus the 12 apostles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's sort of the position I took. I mean, if I allow Scripture to interpret itself, that's what it, I mean, it's, it, it's an inference, it seems to me. Uh, that maybe we can infer by the fact that you have the 12 gates for the 12 tribes and you have the foundation stones for the 12 apostles. That maybe that's you know twelve and twelve is twenty four. I mean it's the only place that I see specific mention of twelve specific people groups. Um, but you know I guess at this point it is pure speculation. Yeah, I mean yeah, probably the strongest evidence are the twelve gates and the, the twelve foundations. Other yeah. than that, I don't I don't know that we have any any strong evidence to really point us in a, in a particular direction. Okay, so, so then in verse five we move on to the. Um, seven spirits of God, and we don't need to go really deep into this again, but because uh, we talked about that on episode 14 uh, regarding the Holy Spirit, but just as a refresher, um, what's your take on the seven spirits? Are there seven up there plus the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit containing <laughs> seven personalities, or what, what's, uh, what would your take be on the seven Holy Spirits, because they're of God? Yes, um... Well, you know, yeah, I mean, obviously there's one God, and we, he, we understand him to be existent as Father, Son, and, and Spirit. Um, you know, who are these seven spirits? Now, it is interesting that, you know, I think we, we may not have mentioned the possibility that this could be referring to angels. Um, and hmm. that, that would seem to be a kind of a different take. However, we have... Uh, evidence of this in uh, in Revelation, I believe it is chapter one, where it talks about the uh, the seven spirits, and I'm just trying to find the exact passage uh, of where it says that. Um, but we have. Verse uh, 20, the mystery of the seven stars, which is on my right hand, the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and seven lampstands, which is the seven churches. So that is an allusion to that. But we do have another reference to uh, spirits. Let me just look this up here in, 
here in the uh, in the book of Revelation. So, you know, it, it does talk about the, the spirits, that these, these angels are also known as spirits. So, you know, I think that was something that we really didn't talk about uh, before, and, you know, maybe we should have, because it, it is rather interesting. Um, you know, we do see in Revelation 16, I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, uh, for, they are un, for they are spirits of demons. So there we have the reference to the spirits, um, you know, being some kind of angelic, in this case, fallen angels. Um, so, you know, I just, that is just, uh, I, I don't, I don't know. If, 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 unless these are somehow manifestations of God himself, which I think is very likely, uh, it, it, it could be a reference to some kind of angels. But again, I just don't think we have enough to go on to make a, a really tight case on that. Yeah, I think, uh, again, without going into too much of a repeat, because we went, I think, pretty deep into this in episode 14 uh, regarding Isaiah 11 and the description of the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon the Spirit of Wisdom and Understanding and Counsel of Might and Knowledge and Fear of the Lord. Um, and the Septuagint version would lead you to believe that these are seven additional Holy Spirits of God uh, along with the Holy Spirit. Uh, King James leads you to believe that, that that these are manifestations or parts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but that's sort of, I think, where I would go with it. As I think it, that's, I think it, it has a parallel in Isaiah 11. That's that's what I think is going on there. <laughs> yeah, um, well, I mean, we, we went through a whole episode on that, so yeah, <laughs> we'll we'll probably just kind of move on. But so keep going, uh, verse okay. six. <laughs> yeah, we were moving along here. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. Now, the thing to understand here is that this it's not a it's not a sea made of glass, but it's a it's a sea water that is as smooth as glass. That's mm -hmm. like crystal. That's how smooth it is. We've all, well, many of us have been on the water when it's been as smooth as glass, right? Uh, in fact, if you're on a sailboat, you don't want to be out on those days because you're not going anywhere. <laughs> That's a bad day. I know. You're like, oh, the, you know, the sea is like glass. I mean, I've said that. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I used to think that this was some kind of a, a crystalline kind of sea, that it was made of crystal, made of glass. But I, I realized, like, no, it's not talking about that. Really, what you have is you have God, in fact, let's let's go to Revelation 22 to get the full picture. Revelation 22, verse 1, it says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. So from God's throne is coming the river of life. It's clear as crystal. Notice that. And in Revelation 4, it's there's now this sea like a a pool or you know a pool or a pond or something. Uh, it's kind of like in Washington D.C. we have the reflection pond, the reflection pool. And that's I think the same idea that before God you have this reflection pool. It's incredibly calm, so it's so calm that it's it's as, it's smooth as glass, like crystal. Hmm. And it's the river of life that's coming out of the throne of God, out of God Himself. This water's coming out, and this water is just sitting there. It's just it's perfectly still, and that is what's before God. Hmm. Beautiful. Then you have uh, in uh, verse seven, the first beast was like a lion, the second like a calf, and the third beast had a face of a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. That sounds like the same creature that uh, we see in Ezekiel. Yeah, exactly. And in fact, I think they're the same creatures that we have in Isaiah chapter 6. The only difference is that in Isaiah chapter 6, they appear to have uh, six wings, whereas in uh, Ezekiel, they appear to have four wings. And I'm and not these, sure how to reconcile that. These have six. That. Yeah, and these clearly have six. In know, verse so 8. They're the same as Isaiah. Uh, so what about the ones that are in Ezekiel? Well, I mean, otherwise, you know, their faces uh, all match up. And yeah. I, I'm just wondering, you know, could there be something that a matter of perspective of like, you know, seeing six wings or seeing four wings, uh, maybe two are not mentioned, because their description in Ezekiel chapter 1 is that they're all fiery, they have lightning and all this stuff, uh, and they're called, they're called burning coals. 
Well, the word for burn is saraf. It means to burn. So the idea of seraphim or seraphim are just the burning ones. That's literally what it means. So yeah. I, I make the case that uh, the seraphim are the same as the kruvim, the same as the cherubim. And oh, really? Not not two separate beings? I, I don't see there to being two separate beings. Wow. Uh, be, because we have really, the, you know, the, the, the description is exactly the same. Uh, so, yeah. you know, that's how I... Now, I could be wrong on that. You know, maybe there are just two distinct beings up there, and, you know, there's there's a, a, a version with four wings, and there's a version with six wings. Uh, you yeah. know, maybe that's the case. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I'm tempted to say, uh, I don't know, I think what we have are really one and the same, uh, one of the same kind of creatures. So, mm. that's my take on that. Yeah, well, they they sing before the throne. They declare, "Holy, holy, holy is God Almighty." Um, give honor and thanks. Uh, the four and twenty elders fall down before Him that sat on the throne and worship Him that lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before Him, saying, "You are worthy." Yeah. Well, I think we we got yeah. through chapter four. And, yeah. Um, well, and and they also I was also point out in Ezekiel chapter ten, we're told that they have. Uh, eyes all around. Also in Ezekiel chapter one, they're yeah, they're too. full of eyes all around. So that's why you know, though they're called uh, they're called kruvim in Ezekiel, but then then the same kind of creature you have that's saying holy, 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 in the book of uh, Isaiah chapter six. Again, uh, to me these seem like exactly the same. The only difference is the number of wings that they have, and maybe there's something um, as a matter of perspective that. That was left out, or, or just you know. Well, uh, re regarding their particular attributes, um, you know, being like a calf, a lion, a man, and an eagle, do you think that they represent uh, kingdoms, including the human kingdom, the animal kingdom, the bird kingdom? Do you think yeah. that there's a significance to the specific types that we see on there? Yeah, I do. I, I think that's very, very likely. That uh, you know these seem to be uh, the greatest of all of the uh, of, of the kingdoms. Although you know how we're going to explain lions as opposed to a calf, uh, what's the difference between those? I mean, we have to right. We've got to answer that. I mean, lions and calves. You know, they're they're beasts. They're beasts, right? You know, so um, you know, is one carnivorous, the other isn't. But that wasn't really God's original agenda. Right. So, you know, maybe there's you know two different kinds of beasts. That that becomes uh, kind of a, that becomes a very tricky question, at least for me to answer. I don't yeah. know if I can answer that. Well, where I was going with that is, do you think that uh, you know Tom Horn just put out a new book with the, I think it was with his son. I think he his, he co-wrote with his son about do animals go to heaven? Do you think that this might be evidence that uh, the animal kingdom praises God too? Interesting. Uh, possibly, uh, you know, he made all these creatures for his pleasure. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I mean, we know in in uh, Numbers, chapter twenty two, or four, twenty four, God opens the mouth of uh, the donkey. Right. You know, I, and that's always been a curious story in my mind because it's like, wow, could you know, could animals really talk? Well, according to that, I mean, God, it's a matter of God opening their mouth. Yeah. Uh, apparently, they don't have a lot to say, but they have enough to say. You know, yeah. like, hey, <laughs> you know, it doesn't start philosophizing, philosophizing, but, uh, but the donkey has some pretty wise things to say. You know, what did I, have I ever acted like this in all these years? You know, yeah. why are you beating me now? And, um, you know, so yeah, there certainly could be something that, you know, as far as animals going to heaven, well, who knows? I mean, you know, do their, I mean, this says that their souls go back into the, into the earth, whereas ours go up to God. So, you know that, uh, you know I don't know. Will you know? Will your 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 very same Fido be there, or will it be just a, a nice replica of Fido? Uh, who knows? I mean, but there are animals on the other side of the veil. We yes. see that in Second Kings, where uh, Elisha and his servant they they see through the veil and they see horses and chariots of fire. Of course, Elijah was taken up. Uh, in a chariot of fire, uh, presumably, so pre presumably there are horses on that for that thing. Uh, Jesus is coming back on a horse, so 
there are horses over there. Uh, you know, how can God do that? I don't know. He's God. He can do amazing things that are far above us and beyond us. But, you know, there are animals on the other side. Whether these animals that we own today are going to go there, who, uh, who, who's to say? I, I don't know if we can really make that argument. Yeah, fair enough. I haven't read the book yet, and I'm hoping to get them on the radio and talk about it sometime soon. But that's probably all the time we have for this show. So we'll, I guess, wrap this one up and see you next week. God bless.